We shall bring you further news as quickly as we can. Welcome to the next stop on our historical journey. So far, we travel through different epochs from prehistory and first forms of proto diplomacy through early civilization of ancient East, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and their invention of, among other things, writing. Recording in then progress. To ancient Greece, Rome, and Byzantine Empire with their really rich legacy. We made an important stop in Renaissance Italy and then moved straight to the 19th century, the period of the Vienna Congress and the invention of a telegraph, a major breakthrough in the way we communicate, engage and uh, uh, conduct international relations. This paved the way for today's discussion when we will talk about all the inventions in technology that mark the end of the 19th and the beginning of 20th century and the influence they had on diplomacy and geopolitics of the time of that important era, which has influenced developments till our very early days. Telephony and wireless radio, if you call it, call it, together with telegraph, constitute the three most important inventions that have shaped communication up until today. The telegraph, the linked communication from physical transport and traveling. The telephone transferred voice over distance and wireless radio, the link communications from almost any physical medium. Those were their three major impacts. As we will see, they have also strongly influenced diplomacy and international relations. The telephone made possible close contacts among heads of states, including various red lines. Wireless communication radio had a strong impact on communication, geopolitics, and the way how wars were conducted. Some diplomatic issues of today, like security, privacy, neutrality, that we raised already on discussion on telephone and wireless communication are still being discussed today in the context of digital policy, internet governance. Invention of the telephone like many other invention had many fathers. The idea for the telephone came uh, far sooner than it was brought to reality. The general and widely accepted view is that the inventor of the telephone was Alexander Graham Bell. But his breakthrough was the culmination of work done by many individuals. One of the early successful experiments with telephony was done by Italian immigrant to the United States, Antonio Meucci, back in 1854. He invented the first communication device in 1854 and called it a teletrofono, probably I pronounce it well in Italian. Meucci experimented with the telephony 20 years before Bell, but he went bankrupt and could not afford to patent it. Recently, he was officially acknowledged as the inventor of telephone by the US Congress, and it was great historical justice. In 1861, German Philip Rice created a prototype of the telephone that transmitted voice sounds electrically over distance. Alicia Gray invented the tone telegraph some sort of harmonic telegraph in 
75, I'm sorry, and was granted US patent named electric telegraph from transmitting musical tones. Interesting highlight. Although not the first to experiment with the telephone device, what makes Alexander Graham Bell important in the history of telephony is the fact that he had enough capital, curiosity, and creativity to make telephony a practical utility. Bell and the companies founded in his name were first to develop a commercially uh, practical telephones around which a very successful business could be built and grow. It can be argued that Bell invented the telephone industry, not necessarily telephony. But telephone was not received with the acclamation and the red carpet. Bell encountered opposition from at that time very powerful telegraph company, Western Union. It was a leading telegraph operator. Bell wanted to sell them his patent and technology for the telephone, but they thought it was laughable. And here I will quote what was their answer. They said, the idea is idiotic. Furthermore, why would any person want to use this ungainly and impractical device when he can send a messenger to the telegraph office? Technically, we do not see that this device will be ever capable of sending recognizable speech over a distance of several miles. That sounds typical reaction to the new technology. But when Western Union could not stop the development of telephony, it signed a contract with Bell in 1879, stating that telephone should only be used for personal conversation while the telegraph would remain the main communication tool for businesses. Also sounds an interesting example where the restrictions do not work. Obviously, such a clause could not be sustained as telephone became a frequently used communication tool by stockbrokers, bankers, business people, lawyers, doctors, and other professions who depended a great deal on effective communication. This is an interesting historical lesson, how this type of artificial restrictions cannot sustain the time. Let's focus on telecommunication network in uh, 1900. The fusion of this new technology was uneven. It was influenced by various technical, economic, and social factors. In 1900, an early communication divide similar to the modern digital divide was more or less obvious. Therefore, device, technological device always existed. A considerable difference between US and Europe was present as was with North and South division within Europe itself with the most dense telecommunication network in Sweden and much lower in Italy. Sometimes such as in the case of France or Germany who had a similar level of overall technological development, the same pattern did not apply to adoption of telephone. Germany had three times bigger telephone penetration than France. This is an interesting dynamics, different dynamics within Europe itself. The importance of telephone in diplomacy uh, was uh, very high, as we'll see in the next uh, few minutes. Namely, for a long time, the spread of the telephone was limited by the problems encountered in sustaining the strength of telephone signals over longer distance. It took a few decades to get the first direct telephone line between, for example, New York City and San Francisco only in the, just before the First World War in 1914. And even longer for, for transatlantic telephone lines between US and Europe in 1956, long time after the end of the Second World War. But the telephone had enormous social impact. It became an integral part of private, 
professional and official life in the most societies around the world. The real impact of telephone on international relations was felt after the Second, Second World War, after 1945. Country leaders, especially of the, those of two superpowers, started using telephone in order to avoid further escalation on, in the international crisis and reducing the risk of the nuclear war. It has been reported that telephone played an important role in international crises, and I can list a few of them. For example, the Six Day War in the Middle East in uh, 1967, Indian Pakistan crisis in uh, 1971, then the Arab Israel War in 1973, and the invasion of Afghanistan by Soviet Union in 1979. All of those crises, communication between Moscow and Washington existed as important sort of controlling factor. But what was very interesting during the Cuban crisis in 1961, the US and the Soviet Union were on the brink of the war. The existing ways of communication between Washington and Moscow were too slow for the events happening, which was very dramatic. For example, it took uh, Washington nearly 12 hours to receive and decode Khrushchev's 3,000 words initial message. By the time of their reply, it had been written and edited by the White House, Moscow had sent another even tougher message. Under severe time pressure, both leaders ultimately decided to communicate through the media, which was very, very dangerous, risky. But lesson was learned. After the crisis was resolved, the hotline proposal became an immediate priority. The first message was sent on August 30th, 1963, including numbers and apostrophes to ensure the connection worked properly. And the US sent the following message. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog's backs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a comma, inverted commas, full stop. It's a common text message that includes all 26 letters of the English alphabet. The first official use of this red line or hotline was to announce the association of a GFK to Soviet Union, to inform them. It is said that the uh, 1958 book, Red Alert, which prompted the movie Dr. Strangelow, gave governments official the idea to connect directly, specifically, by showing the benefit of fast and direct communication. It was early inspiration for this red line. Although it was called the red telephone, uh, the element of telephone was an urban legend. Initially, it was a telegraph followed by a fax and lately an advanced email system. The phrase the red telephone or a hotline is to describe direct communication between the two leadership of two countries in the case of crisis. It became a symbol we can say of importance and exclusivity in the relation between countries. Uh, after the United States and Soviet Union, it made other countries, mainly the UK and France, establishing exclusive communication line at that time with Moscow. Today, leaders maintain exclusive contact via mobile phones, although there are all still special lines and there is discussion after Biden-Putin summit of having special line in case of cyber conflicts. Therefore, it is returning in a way back to the, to, the, to the fashion. Let us now quickly pause here and see uh, uh, if there are any uh, comments or uh, questions uh, from the audience so far, because we are still with the cables. Now we'll be moving to wireless communication, but let's hear uh, if we have any, any comment uh, from the, or question from the audience. Over to you, I guess, Andriana. 
and let them take some water. Moment, uh, currently, it's still uh, very quiet. I suppose that we are all listening to you very closely. Uh, I, for one, am having much fun. I did study international relations, but I haven't heard much about the importance of the telephone for diplomacy. So I hope there will be more questions and comments in the following minutes. Back to you. Thank you, Andriana. We are moving now to the wireless from the cables from telephone. We are moving now to, uh, to the wireless uh, communication and the rush for new invention marked the whole of the 19th century. Towards the end of the century, wireless communication became the new scientific frontier. The very first use of radio transmitted uh, coded information was a result of the work of James Clark Maxwell from Britain and Heinrich Hertz from Germany with their pioneering experiments using electromagnetic waves to convey the message, to communicate. And you can see their photos on the slide. Maxwell namely provided the theoretical basis which Hertz confirmed through experiment. Their scientific discovery was used for subsequent inventions in the field of uh, wireless communications. Started, for example, with the wireless telegraph through wireless telephony and concluding uh, with the radio broadcasting. That was its important moment scientific breakthrough the two of them made. Among other inventors who worked on wireless communication, we should mention Edward Brainley, Oliver Lodge, and Alexander Popov. Nikola Tesla, which is not widely known, was particularly noticeable for designing both emitters and receptors of electromagnetic waves. He used the term wireless telegraphy. Radio as a term uh, appeared only after the First World War. Tesla had also designed a technical solution for transmitting power wireless. Where he made an important contribution. Indian professor, uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose from uh, Calcutta was the pioneer of research in uh, radio uh, technology and demonstrating for the first time ever wireless communication using radio waves. And he said, that's now for discussion of public good, it's important. He said, it is not the inventor, but the invention that matters. And he never patented his work. Bose believed knowledge should be available to everyone and not constrained by patenting. Great lesson for nowadays public good discussion. Capitalizing on the previously described inventions, Italian scientist Giuliano Marconi invented a wireless communication device like a bell previously. In 1897, he registered a patent on his wireless telegraph. In addition to his invention, Marconi had other advantages and in particular talent that helped him to make a business out of it and to disseminate the device. He, but help also had a family, very good family ties and business link with Great Britain. At that time, the world leader in telecommunication, especially at the end of the 19th century. His marketing, family and public relations help him to sec secure a few very lucrative deals with the British Admiralty and British shi shipping companies, which was at that time the way how to make a business. In 1907, Marconi wireless telephony system became a public service for transatlantic exchange between Europe and the United States. The main user of Marconi's wireless telegraph were the British and Italian militaries. And this Marconi's role is very interesting for digital policy. But we have also something which we call, call it wireless geostrategy. Last month, we mentioned that the UK, together with the US, established a monopoly in cable communication, seabed cables. At one point, they two countries control over 70% of the global telegraph cable infrastructure. It triggered reaction. Namely, the countries that were lagging behind in the cable 
infrastructure, mainly the time Germany and France started using intensively wireless radio communication as a way to bypass cable monopoly and to make some sort of balance of telecommunication power. This was particularly important to Germany whose weak cable-based communication infrastructure could not match Germany's increasing geopolitical and geostrategic ambitions. And the German government supported heavily research and development in the field of wireless communication. In 1903, two pioneering producers of wireless telegraphy set, AEG and Siemens Halske, merged under government pressure into a new company, Telefunken, Siemens Telefunken, I'm sure that are familiar brands even today. In attempt to exploit his invention uh, uh, to the maximum on the other side, Marconi established a monopoly, but not allowing operators who use this system to communicate with the radio apparatus by other companies, including at that time Telefunken. Germany tried to challenge this monopoly at two radio telegraph conferences in 1903 and 1906. We're speaking now already on the ITU, early ITU. And uh, these parallels between that time and this time are fascinating. Although the majority of countries, members of the ITU were against Marconi's monopoly, the objections of Great Britain and Italy kept the status quo till 1912. They kept it by not forcing Marconi to make his system interoperable with other prod producers. If you read the ITU constitution, you can see that interoperability is one of the main aims of the ITU. Therefore, it can be traced back and to, to that time. It was, we can call it browser or platform war of the wireless telegraph age. But things changed in 1912 after the Titanic catastrophe. The sinking of Titanic was a moment of far reaching consequences for telecommunication policy in general and in particular radio communication. One of the reasons why more people, passengers from Titanic were not saved was that the nearby ship, California, which was just five miles from the Titanic, did not receive the distress radio signal from Titanic. The first ship, which operated the same telecommunication infrastructure, that came to save the passenger was the Carpathia, which was 45 miles away. There were two major companies that provided the equipment operators, Marconi Company in New York and Telefunken in Germany. The Titanic was subscribed to Marconi. And as we saw, we heard the Marconi issued an edict that any operator who talked to a Telefunken sh uh, uh, ship, which was a California ship, would be immediately received uh, relieved of duty upon his return in the port. Telefunken issued a similar order. This is why the Titanic SOS went unanswered by the California Telefunken ship, which we know now was only five miles away. The Carpathia, which operated Marconi equipment, heard the SOS and was able to respond even though they were some distance away. While it is not completely certain what happened in the communication uh, with the Titanic, it's clear that the sinking of the Titanic had a far reaching impact on global telecommunication pro uh, policy. Almost after the 10 years of the blockage, the International Radio Telegraph Conference held in 1912 ended first Marconi monopoly by introducing the principle of interconnectivity among radio telegraph systems. And it is radio telecommunication is one of the three pillars of the ITU till today. 
Then we will focus on another aspect now on the raising importance of media, which was now distributed wirelessly in the period between 1814 and 1914, so-called a golden phase, both in diplomacy, long peace phase, an impact on development of communication. The long peace phase of 100 years was initiated by Congress of Vienna, 1814, which introduced so-called concert of Europe as the way to deal with international crisis. It was the vague consensus among European monarchies who favored preservation of the territorial and political status quo. And important questions were discussed at the, their congresses and their gatherings. But during this period, the importance, uh, uh, there were increasing rates of importance of question of privacy, security, neutrality of telecommunication. The new political environment context, especially towards the end of 19th century, influenced by the development of communication technology had a considerable impact on the question of peace, question of uh, outbreak of war. Both diplomats and the military had to adjust their methods, working methods to the, this new changing communication environment. The emergence of radio, and raising importance of the press led to a different operational also uh, space for uh, diplomats. The public in particular began to challenge the close and exclusive club of negotiators assembled through the Concert of Europe established at the Vienna Congress. Mass literacy and growing number of newspapers triggered the development of public opinions. More or less towards the end of the 19th century, diplomats became increasingly concerned about the reaction of their public, domestic public, to their activities and negotiation. This public would, would became much more informed about diplomatic activities. And exactly this development of public opinion put enormous pressure on international relations. Faced with this new conceptual thread, monarchies and the governments introduced censorship and started using newspapers for foreign propaganda. The US invasion in Cuba in 1898, at the end of the 19th century, was the first example of the importance of the media in international relations. Many historians believe that if it had not been for media, hysteria, this war between Spain and the US could have been avoided. And this was effectively illustrated by the following anecdote. A journalist sent from Cuba sent the following message to US media mogul Hearst. He said, everything is quiet. There is no trouble here. There will be no war. Wish to return. The reply from Hearst was, please remain. You furnish the picture and I'll provide the war. We will talk more about this development next month when our topic is, will be radio and TV broadcasting, TV broadcasting. I want you to register, the link is available in chat. Meanwhile, in Africa, the development of the first telephone network coincided with the great push of European powers to establish a more solid control over inland Africa and eventually divide the whole continent into their colonies, France, Britain, less Portugal and Spain. This effort was characterized by the construction of railway lines that were closely followed by telegraph and telephone lines. Already by 1890s, there were towns in Africa with telephone services available, especially in East Africa, Nairobi on the road from Mombasa to Uganda. However, the development of telephone lines was done in a way to serve primarily the need of European colonial masters and not the needs of broader local pop uh, population. 
the first idea behind the establishment of telephone line was to link African colonies with the capitals, Britain, French, Germany, and other empires, just as a good illustration uh, about, uh, about this regional controls of, uh, of um, uh, empires and uh, control of different uh, empires were that uh, some cities which were in the real vicinity were called, uh, I think, Congo, Brazzaville and Kinshasa were connected via France to each other. Then it started changing in Africa with the fight for uh, independence and there have been more and more pushes to create interconnection, not to con connect Brazzaville and Kinshasa via Paris or Brussels, but to connect it directly. And this was one of the first problems posed in front of the Pan-African Telecommunication Network formed in 1962 in Dakar, Senegal. However, it took at least a decade, if not even more, to implement the first step and the project, and then African countries started connecting by a combination of Cooper wire, microwave links, and started creating a direct connection. Also, when we speak of our African telecommunications, it's important to know that the first submarine cable to North Africa was laid in 1956, and it was extended only 1969 to sub-Saharan part of the continent. Another specificity for Africa, which is uh, that the slow dissemination of landlines was one of the main reasons why mobile telephone technology became the preferred options among users and thus developed an astonishing speed recently. That was one of the uh, historical reasons why we have such a growth of the mobile, mobile telephone in Africa. Therefore, so far, we made the journey from uh, last month telegraphy via telephony, we stay with cables and then we moved wireless. We moved to wireless communication, wireless telegraphy and uh, later on to the radio, radio communication. And we close our journey with focus this month on Africa and the way how Africa started getting a connection. Before I move to our usual uh, ritual of having the drink uh, of the month, let me just check with, uh, with uh, Andriana if there is any question or comment. Thank you for the floor, Jovan. We had two, uh, well, one comment and one question. The first comment was from Muleza, who said that without the advanced form of communication we see today, the world would not have made such, prog such progress in quick information dissemination to its citizens and countries abroad. And uh, it seems that your example with the Titanic struck a chord with George because he asked, were the operators forbidden to talk with operators uh, of other companies or did the incompatibility not allow it? So were they able to hear the messages? Were they ignoring them? And George says he can't imagine the rivalry forbade any response to a distress signal. And uh, while George was typing that out, I did a bit of research and apparently the telegraphist from the Titanic was very busy telegraphing that a poker game will be on that night and he didn't see messages about ice. And when the um, SS Californian telegraphed, he said, shut up, I'm busy. So he was very um, overwhelmed with all kinds of private messages that the uh, passengers of the Titanic wanted to pass on to, for example, uh, their loved ones uh, saying, hey, we're having dinner, we're thinking about you. Uh, and uh, Pavlina asked, um, until the adoption of the internet, cables were used for communication purposes, but now especially submarine cables have greater importance. Could we touch on the differences between then and now? And over to you, Jovan, that will be all. Great, as always, great comments from George. Thank you, George. Uh, we, we miss you for the, our, our great historical and philosophical chart. And you were right. One of the, there is, was a set of the reasons. They established the SOS uh, standard uh, during the radio telecommunication com conference. And you were right that the telegraphs were used, uh, used uh, loosely. And one of the conclusion was that the operator should be 
attended uh, to the telegraph 24 hours a day at uh, i think in carpathia or california the operator was uh, was basically um, uh, having having a break but i can i can um, um, share later on more detailed uh, elements of what was happening uh, that night and it's very very revealing and interesting but what is important for us i would say that uh, first the prolonged discussions about basically marconi monopoly was stopped in the 1912 the ITU moved in, established a radio telecommunication regulation, which is more or less enforced till, uh, till today. And it was an interesting moment that uh, uh, in the long history of the ITU, United States from the late 19th century, from the St. Petersburg Conference 8075, was always reluctant to have the government regulation. That was always, at that time, was difference between the United States arguing for the privately driven telecommunication, mainly European countries, Germany and France, arguing for the state monopolies. The only point in this long history, from the very beginning, from 1875 till, I would say today, was the radio telecommunication regulation, when the US, because of the huge pressure around Titanic issue, agreed a bit to have a more role of intergovernmental agreement. It's interesting especially when we discuss these days, uh, digital and internet, how some lines in the way of the how countries approach innovation are really, really, really long. And I'm sure, that, George, that could be an interesting discussion and maybe a webinar that we can host that uh, you can also bring your rich experience. But in brief, yes, there were a set of the problems. Yes, the radio telecommunication regulation include, introduced this table of communication, in, including SOS distress signal, and they require from the maritime companies to operate, uh, to have the telecom operators available next to their apparatus 24 hours uh, a day, among other things. But we'll follow up with more details, uh, details on it. Uh, Pavlina, uh, uh, about uh, submarine um, cables, uh, let's let, let let me put it in this way. There is here again continuity, because even today, fiber optic cables carry the most global uh, uh, traffic, and uh, we have we'll see what will happen with the SpaceX and the Elon Musk experiments. But most of the wireless communication, because of technical limitations, are coming up to the low orbit satellites, which can provide solid uh, uh, background uh, bandwidth and uh, low latency. Latency is in particular important. Therefore, satellite communication and wireless has not replaced long distance telecommunication, which remain carried by the cables. In the 19th century, Cooper cables, nowadays fiber optic and even some more innovative technologies. Therefore, in that sense, we have continuity. We have continuity and uh, still most of the traffic between Europe and Asia is going through the fiber optic cables via Suez, via Aden, around India, Malacca Strait. Only major shift which can happen, but it's not to the, this dilemma, is the shift towards overland cables, which uh, uh, are part on the Belt and Road Initiative of China. Therefore, we may have a shift from submarine cables to overland. And one has to, to see how, 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 it will, how it will function. I guess I answered both questions. I can see that there is a busy exchange with the comments from uh, George and, uh, and, other, and, other, and uh, other colleagues. Now, uh, Andriana, with your kind permission, if there are no other comments, I will move to the most... Uh, interesting part, I would say, definitely the most um, sort of uh, enjoyable. It's a drink of the month, historical drink of the month. And then with that, we will conclude today's session. Andriana, any other comment? No, you are, you are free to proceed to the alcohol. Oh, well, in this case, alcohol. Next time will be something different. Therefore, uh, uh, cheers with the, uh, well, I'll just adjust camera that you can see what's, what's happening. Uh, Cheers to uh, to uh, uh, drink uh, this this month. I'm sorry, there is this connection. Uh, you can hear me well. Yes. Yes, we can. 
Yes, you hear me well? Hello? Yes, you and we can hear you. Okay, okay. Let me, let me just... Uh, uh, this month, uh, we will talk about absinthe, the drink of the so-called Belle Epoque. That spirit of scandalous reputation was adored by Belle Epoque artists, condemned by anti-alcohol leagues, and long outlawed in the Europe and the United States. The Green uh, Fairy, as uh, absinthe was called, was the first created in the, 90, uh, in the 1790s by Pierre Ordinaire, a French doctor living in Switzerland, another great uh, contribution of the Swiss invention. Dr. Ordinaire created uh, absinthe with intent for it to be used for an alcohol-based elixir distilled from the bitter tasting herb uh, Artemisia absinthium or warm wood. The warm wood plant holds a secret. It's a natural rich in tuyone, if I'm correct, a chemical compound believed to trigger inexplicable transformation of the mind. We are getting to the interesting, interesting point. Many reported uh, mind illuminating uh, eff effects of uh, absinthe believing that it uh, enhanced perception, creativity, and enabled the ability to see beyond. Typically, there is a specific ritual when serving the drink. And uh, I'll try to, to, to do it. I was advised to, the, to do it, but you will bear with me. You have a special glass. You have a sugar. And you, have, uh, you, have, uh, you basically burn the, the sugar. And then you put, there is a bit of flame, but trust me. And then you put the Epstein uh, uh, to be uh, caramelized. There are now a few, few ways. Okay. Let me see. You can see what I'm doing, I guess. Yep. One way is to put it to be caramelized through the this fire. And uh, and after some time, you just put uh, sugar back. Oh, you see, I'm a bit clumsy, but uh, I was taught by experts how to do it. Therefore, uh, absinthe is then drink, and I'll just make a sip. And with that, uh, cheers from, uh, from Geneva and cheers from uh, our uh, stop on radio communication, telephony, another important uh, issue. And I wish you. Really nice day, nice week, till the next month and next stop in our journey and definitely next drink, uh, which we will try it, representing time and epoch. In this case, it is absent. Cheers. Oh, it's quite strong. Thank you very much for joining us today. Recording stopped. Okay.